Sorry, y'all are like, get her off the stage. Um, <laughs> I'm back. Okay, this part, I that's probably why I ran away, because I think I was more nervous about introducing Gabriel than about giving my own talk, because the stakes feel a lot higher, because um, Gabriel's just one of the most unique, kind-hearted, special people you'll ever meet. So it's a real honor for me to get to tell you a little bit more about him. Uh, so Gabriel Lopez is a senior navigator at Homeboy Industries, which is the organization that we both work at in Los Angeles, um, where we strive to offer hope, training, and resources to formerly incarcerated and formerly gang-involved individuals. And um, what, what I can say about Gabriel is that he's really the heart and joy of our organization. So every morning we have something called a morning meeting where we all come together and give announcements and someone gives a thought of the day and then we end with a little prayer. And a lot of times people um, go up to talk and they feel really nervous and they kind of choke up a little bit. And Gabriel always do, does this thing where he'll be like, yeah, Donna! And then like everyone just starts laughing and everyone just, kind of, it completely breaks the ice and he's made so many people feel comfortable in stepping up in that way. And that really, I think, speaks to his character and his heart. And he brings so much humor to our organization on a daily basis. Um, and that's just, that's just talking about his spirit and his heart. I haven't even touched on his intellect because he's a genius. And he has, um, he's earned his associate's degree already. He's working towards a second associate's degree. And in a few months, we'll be transferring to a four-year college. All of this he's done while being an honors student. He got an A in the hardest class in the college, statistics, which <laughs> um, he's really an inspiration for so many of the folks in our program who have never thought about getting a GD, never thought about going to college, never thought it was possible for them. When they see that Gabriel has done it, and not only has he done it, but he has relished it so much, and he's brought so much joy to it, and has become such a leader on his campus, um, it, it's inspired countless, countless people in the organization. And then as a navigator, he kind of works as a mentor, counselor, supervisor, all of those things in once. And so he's really responsible for the experience that a cohort of people who walk through our doors have. And all of the trainees who have the privilege of having uh, Gabriel as their navigator have a great experience because <laughs> they have an amazing, amazing navigator. So um, when I think about transformative justice and what that means, it's embodied by Gabriel. You know, we had a shooting incident at our organization um, earlier in the year, and the way that Gabriel was able to show love and care for all the parties who were involved and really hold all of the people who were impacted by the harm, to me, is what I think about when I think about transformative justice. So I really thank you for the example that you have set for me and for so many others who walk through our doors and. Um, I'm really excited to hear an actually good talk. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thank you so much, Donna, for that introduction. I'm just, I'm just Gabriel. It's nothing that major. But Donna, like, I love you so much. You're like, um, like our institutional agent at Homeboy Industries. Like, you use your social capital, and you open doors for all the homies that walk through our door, that no way in the world imaginable we could be, open, be able to open these doors. And the honest door is always open. So as we talk about people getting released from prisons, the obstacles we face, and a lot of them have, are legal matters, old warrants, immigration, there's endless child support, um, baby mama drama, which is very common. Um, the honest door is always open and she helps us so much. And thank you, thank you for that, Donna. So my name is Gabriel. I'm a senior navigator at Homeboy Industries. So I'm a mentor. I mentor, I'm a peer mentor and a youth mentor. I work with gang members that are trying to change their lives for the first time that, as they walk through our doors. Because I remember walking through the doors five years ago, my face full of tattoos, knowing I wanted desperately to change my life, but not having no idea in the world on how to change my life. I know Homeboy Industries is um, I guess you could say it's a structural functionalism where it's just every part 
at Homeboy Industries plays a vital part to keep the organization running to change people's lives like my as well as mine's. Um, before I even start, I want to elaborate on exactly what a gang member is and what a gang is. Um, so to get jumped into a gang, right, you're going to let your friends stand there and beat you. And they're going to keep beating you, and they're going to beat you and beat you until they're tired of beating you so that you can officially become a part of them so that you can die for them. You're willing to die so much. You want to be loved so much that you're willing to die for it. So an individual must have, has to be broken right here and right here to make that decision. And it takes me back to elementary school. I remember um, after school, second grade, third grade, all the way to sixth grade, there would be um, after school program. So it would be like always like 15, 20, 30 kids that would always stay after school and after school program. They would not go home. And we do what kids do. We would get in trouble, play kickball, hide and go seek, break windows and run, do what kids do. Simultaneously, on the weekends, we'll be playing baseball. After the, our baseball games, we wouldn't go home. We'd stay at the park, do what kids do, right? At the school, 5 o'clock, they'll, the, they'll close the gates and lock the gates. So we would leave. Once, once the janitor left, we jumped the gates again. We would jump back into school, run into the school. And the truth is, none of us wanted to go home. All those kids ended up joining the same gang I did. And we were broken kids. And we did not, we didn't have an outlet. We didn't talk about what we were going through. No one ever said, no one, no one ever said why they didn't want to go home. I can't go home because my, my dad's going to beat me. Or my mom's all beat up right now. My uncle touches me. We, we shoved it all in. So, Corey talked about, she kept mentioning the word broken, broken, broken. And it, it took me back to when I was, um, and actually, I was having lunch with Father Greg um, a couple of months ago, and I was telling him a lot about, about my girlfriend, Anna, right? And she says, did you tell him how I was a broken child, right? And then I forgot the, the exact text, but she said, broken crayons color. And it took me back to when I was a kid, and I was, um, we used, at those, there was a market, and every holiday, Easter, Christmas, um, Halloween, they'd have coloring contests. And me and my brother were always into the coloring contests. And we'd take this, suppose it was Easter, we'd have the Easter bunny, right? And we'd have a big bag of crayons and we'd dump the crayons and we would literally fight for the brand new crayons, the whole crayons that have the pretty Crayola wrapper on them that are nice and pointy, and we'd shove all the broken crayons, we just push them aside, and we throw them away. And I think it, it says a lot, like in our society, for example, if I, put, if I had a, something to color right here and I put the crayons on everyone's tables, everyone's gonna push the broken crayons aside. But the truth is that if you got those little broken crayons, the ones with no wrapper left on them, the ones that are, have no points, the little stubs. And if you really took your time and you got those little crayons and you shaded and you put the dark spots where they're supposed to be dark and you colored that picture with, with love and care, the truth is that with those broken pieces, you can paint a, you can color far more prettier picture than you can with those with the whole crayon. So, more about being broken. So my first memories in my life, I believe I was four years old, maybe five. But I remember, um, you know, my father was a heroin addict, and um, my father was very violent, very violent. He used to beat us a lot. He used to beat my mom a lot. Um, I remember, I'll spare the gruesome details, but he used to beat us a lot. He used, it was very violent. He used to have us in, um, you know, his idea of baby, his idea, idea of babysitting when my mom went to work would take us to the dope spot where everyone's slamming heroin 
and I was exposed to people overdosing. I was left with strange men as my dad went out to go steal. Um, and I normalized it. To me, that this, this is what life is. Like, and it's just what it was, right? So my father went back to prison, and um, I believe I was in second grade at the time, and um, we moved to my grandpa's house. So I had two uncles, two aunts, five cousins, my mom, my brother, my grandpa, and, um, and it was a studio apartment, not playing. But it was it was actually a big house, and I'm trying to get it a little bit laugh. Come on, all right. all right, thank you. All right, so um, and it was that time I was in second grade, and I started getting in trouble at school, and um, I started fighting a lot. I was always fighting a lot, and for some reason, I was always hitting girls. I would chase girls on the on the playground, and I was always hitting girls, and um. That's, that's what um, what's really caught my attention. What Donna, what Donna had on the screen, it says nobody enters violence first by committing it. I was introduced to violence at a very young age. Violence equals violence, and her people, her people. So I was always taking that to the schoolyard. I was always fighting, always fighting, and um, I was a broken kid. But for some reason, in second grade, they pulled me out of class one day, and I thought I was in trouble. And they actually told me they were going to put me in a gifted class. So for I went second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade. I was always in the gifted classes, and um, so school and the park were always was always were always my um my escape. I mean, but I always had to go home to my reality. Um, so fast forward to my teenage years, um, all the five cousins I just talked about that we lived in my grandpa's house, my brother, all of us joined the gang, all of us. Um, two of my cousins were murdered at a very young age. One of my cousins was shot and left handicapped at a very young age. Um, I got shot five, on five separate occasions I was shot. So I lived in a house that was headquarters for the gang. My uncles were the shot callers. So at any given time, bullets are gonna ring through, just scatter the house. So we would have to sleep on the floor. And um, we normalized it. It was normal, that's, that's what life is. Um, Fast forward, of course, I got in the same gang, and um, and I gave that life everything I had. You know, when I was 17 years old, I had a son, and um, when I was 19 years old, I had a daughter. And the truth, I'm gonna tell you the honest truth: like I was never a father to them. That was not my priority. That was not my that was not my responsibility. My responsibility was to the gang. And you know, this lifestyle, I I went I took full force. I started doing time when I was 14 years old, in and out of juvenile halls. Um, and not out of county jail. When I was 19 years old, I had um, went to county jail, and my, my as being as an as okay. There's certain rules in prisons and in jails, right? And I'm not talking about the rules from the, from the from the authority, from the cops, from all that. I'm talking about prison rules, as in our own people, right? Our own inmates. And the certain rules we we gotta live by, and which would which would prevent me from actually even trying to go to school or trying to even do something good in their misery loves company, right? And but I rem remember when I was 19 years old, I was I got busted for it was a little something dumb like stealing a car or something, and I remember I was on on the yard where there was a school right there, so I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go for the for the alibi, see what see what is going on in there, and I remember them telling me, "Oh, we could get your GED right here," and I was like, "That'll be cool." You know, I like to show my mom that I got a GED. So um, I go, "Well, how does this work?" They go, "Here, just take this basic skills test and see where you're at." So I took the test, went back the next day. They go, "Hey, you know what? If you want, just take the practice test." I'm like, "I'll take it. Do you take the practice test?" Next day I go back, I'm like, hey, do you want to take the GD test? I was like, I'll take it. So I took I took the GD test and I passed it on my first try. And it was like, and at the truth, I thought that was the end of my academic career. I, I just did that just to show my mom, like, like mom, look, I got my GED. But I went straight back into that um, into that um 
a vicious cycle of gangs, violence, and drugs, and um, and I, I and I speak my truth, right? I was um as my as my reputation grew in the neighborhood, um I seen that I could earn a, a a decent living while I was out, um selling drugs, and what I did was I used my power to um to I was a um an abuser I was um very violent I was a, um a manipulator and I would use women to um sorry women speaking my truth. I would use women to um, open up their houses, to sell drugs, to uh, to open up my door spots. So I destroyed a lot of families. I've gotten kids taken away, DCFS cases, and then I move on to the next one. And that's who I was, and that's what I did. Um, so I would, I would um, go constantly. I would, I couldn't stay out of prison. I couldn't stay out. I was a habitual upscounder. Meaning when I'm released, 24 hours after I'm released, I had to report to my parole officer because I'm on high control parole, and I never did. So 24 hours after I'm released, like I have a warrant for my arrest already. So my mentality is survival. And when when I speak about survival, um, I mean by any means, the survival of the fittest. Growing up in East Los Angeles, there's just a lot of rules that you got to you got to use to survive. And you taught these rules by from a very young age, and you internalize these rules, and these rules become who you are because it's you're in, you're in survival, and then you go to prison, and it's a new set of rules, uh, rules that you got to live by because you're on survival mode. So I I internalize all these new rules, and um, make a long story short. I um couldn't. I would every time I was out. All I would do was just commit horrible acts of violence, sell drugs, and um, I would, when I would get released, I wouldn't stop and think about, hmm, I wonder how my kids are doing. Maybe I should go see them, or if I did go see them, I'd go visit them one time, and take the money, or just show my presence and like hug them, tell them I love them, and I'll be back next week. Like, yeah, I would never go back. And, um, you know, and the truth is, I thought that I was being a better father just from by staying away from them, from them, for, be, other than them seeing who I really am. <clears throat> so I went into that vicious lifestyle, back and forth, back and forth, constant, constant, endless cycle, until one day I went to go visit my mother and, um, I went to go visit my mother, and she told me um, she had cancer. And I remember, like, hugging my mom, and I remember crying. And I remember, like, like Mom, like, I don't want you to die. And she told me, you know what, look, she's a, excuse my language. She, she says, Gabriel, stop being a bitch. And she goes, I have cancer, not you. Because I'm going to fight it. I don't want to die. But, hey, you know what? Maybe it's time to man up. You know what I mean? Maybe it's time to man up and do something with your life. Because I'm not promised to be here forever. And I was like, Mom, like, I'm going to get a job. Like, I'm going to take care of you, Mom. I'm going to take care of you. And two days later, I got arrested and got another prison term going back into, going back into prison and I, and this prison term is not like any prison term I've ever did I was actually the truth of the matter is I was actually set up by um by um LAPD Hollenbeck Police Department um and it was a little the smallest little prison term 16 months with half but in this prison term like I would I was praying hard and then like and like just all I would think about was my mom. Like, mom, God, don't let my mom die. Um, eight months, nine months later, I was released, and I remember going to my mom's house to go visit my mom. And um, there was a note on the door for my sister, saying, "Don't get comfortable. Go to the hospital." And I'm thinking, like, hmm. Right away, like, uh, I knew it was something was wrong. And I ended up going to the hospital and I'm opening that door to the room and I see like all oh, my family there. So I'm like, what the hell? And um, 
you know, my mother was on her deathbed. So I sat by my mom for my mom's side for two days and you know, and I held her hand and I watched her looked her in her eyes and told her, Mom, like I'm gonna change my life for you, Mom. I'm not gonna go to prison no more, I'm not gonna sell no more drugs, I'm not gonna gain me. I'm gonna change my life for you, you know, like you could go now. And I watched my mom take her last breath. And um by now you know me good already. So two months later, of course, I was going back to prison and um and um now, I was, from that day, which was February 20th, 2000, 2008, up until October 11, 2013, I don't know how I survived those years, but I was on a rampage. I was, it was not about making money out of the drugs anymore, it was about, I was, I just didn't want to come back to reality. I was high every day off meth and heroin. I was um, getting, constantly getting locked. I was just on a gang banging rampage. I was just on a rampage. I didn't want to live. I didn't care if I died. And of course I didn't go see my kids. Um, but I remember just the whole, those old years just seemed like a big blur. But I talk about um, October 11th, 2013, right? And the reason why I use that date is because um, I remember going to visit, actually I was having another baby, right? Not me literally, but the, but, uh, but uh, my son's mother. And I remember being in the hospital, and this is my truth. I didn't want to be, I did not want to be in a hospital. I did not want to watch no baby being born because it's all about me, right? I, my phone was blowing up, people wanting to buy drugs. Like, just all my always wanted, hey, where are you at? Let's go kick it. And I'm like, I'm stuck in this hospital watching a baby be born. So I'm like, and the truth of the matter is, the only reason why I was there is because I was using his mother to so I could have somewhere to stay and sell drugs at, and the grandma. And so the grandma was there, so I had to go be there. And, um, but I had no idea what the Lord had, ex had, had, um, had in plan for me, right? Had in store for me. So I remember, like, mad i was high as hell too but i remember i was mad like man i'm stuck in this hospital man watching this baby be born and i remember so he was born boom i cut his umbilical cord and then um i was like good i'm gone I'm leaving i was opening the door boom to the out of the room and um i don't know why for some reason i stopped and i look back and i'm watching i'm watching them um you know check my son's vital signs and stuff like that and I walk back over there, and I'm just looking at this little boy. And at the time, because that was before I took child development classes and all that stuff, at the time I'm thinking he's looking at me, and he can see me. Um, and I was high out of my, on my mind. But, but he's looking towards my direction, and I'm just looking at his stomach, like moving up and down, like breathing. And um, at that moment, on October 11th of 2013, that was the first time in my life that I stopped and thought, like, and I thought to myself, like, damn, homie, like, where did you go wrong? Like, what kind of man would lie to his mother on her deathbed? And what kind of man would have kids and not even raise, not, not even care about them? And at that moment, I thought about my kids, where they were and what they were doing, and what they thought about me. And it was that moment I knew I wanted to change my life. And um, so, of course, you know me. You guys know me good by now. So ten days later, I got busted. And um, <laughs> but this time would, would actually be my last time sitting in the county jail. I was arrested for a parole violation because I mentioned that I, I ran from the gate all the time. I never reported. So I went to the um, you know, I had an awesome, amazing pro officer that I reached out to, and he led me out, took me to a program, and that's where my new my new journey began. Um, one of the guys, one of um, the guys I was was in this program with, he gave me this amazing idea. He said, "Hey, if you go to college, they'll give you financial aid. They'll break you off a lot of money, right?" And it was it was this time that I started to work on myself, started to, and um, so I was like, as the more I started working on myself, I started feeling right. 
So, of course, so I don't want to, like, feel nothing. So I started getting high again. But I started working at Homeboy Industries. I was introduced to Homeboy Industries. And they were telling me, like, about working in yourself, working about who you are. I was like, what the hell are you guys talking about, man? I just want a job. You know what I mean? Just, uh, just put me in the bakery or something. Like, no, we're not about that. We're about running the business of healing. I'm like, okay, whatever. So, and I remember, and I had no idea. When I said I wanted to change my life, like, I had no idea in, well, that what God had, had in store for me. I, mean, I just wanted a job. You know what I mean? And so I ended up going back to rehab for one last time. And um, as I was in rehab, but when I was at Trade Tech College, I was just, all I was taking was carpentry classes. I was just trying to get the most financial aid I could get. You know what I mean? And that's my truth. But when I was in, in, the, in the second rehab, and I was telling people, like, yeah, I was in college, eh? Like, you know? Like, oh, for reals? Like, yeah. And I thought about it, like, man, that was a good feeling to be right there, man. So I remember um, how my journey, my new journey began. I was in San Pedro. Well, you guys don't know. Never mind. Well, I was in L.A., but in one of the far cities by the beach in San Pedro. So I had two hours commute just to get to work, two hours commute just to get back, right? But I, but I had an amazing company on the phone every day. Um, but I, I would... Um, but I was determined. So I got off parole for the first time in my life, and I moved closer. And I re-enrolled in college, at East LA College. And um, at this time, I'm working at Homeboy Industries. And, um, and I'm clean. And this is the part where it gets, um, where the real work starts to kick in, right? Because I'm clean. I'm giving up full-time job at Homeboy Industries as a dishwasher. And I'm washing dishes, boom, taking a bus. Well, I had got a car now, my first car in my life that was under my name, with license, with insurance. It's like I want to get pulled over by the cops now. You know what I mean? Um, and, I'm, and I'm going and I'm doing it, right? I'm thinking I could do this. I could do this for four or six years. I could wash dishes and go to school. I could get my education. But then I started having an identity crisis. And that's what, one of the things that I think every gang member has to go through as he transitions his life, an identity crisis. It dawned on me, one day I'm right there washing dishes. And this was before I got my car, because I remember my thoughts. And I'm looking at the clock. And I'm thinking, what am I doing? I'm right here washing dishes, my shoes are all wet. I'm looking at the clock so I could go catch the train to San Pedro. Like, what am I doing, homie? Like, is this me? And around that same time, when I moved back, when I moved closer, I started going through depression phases. And all those feelings that I shoved down my whole life, started coming out and I started going through like depressions and I was like a, I was like a zombie because I started having feelings for the first time in my life I started having feelings and I would think about everybody that I've harmed as a gang member I would think about all the families that are destroyed all the all the DCFS cases that got open on people all the, like everything I, that I've ever committed, and it started to mess me up for the first time in my life. It started to really bother me. And um, I remember trying to understand why I, I did that to people. And so that's what, that's where come, doing the work comes, that's where doing the work comes comes into my life is I had to understand why I became that person. And it took a long time, but I started to, to internalize myself. And But the stories I told you about my childhood, I remember getting beat by my dad. I remember watching my, my dad, my mom get beat like constantly. I remember like coming home 
with no furniture because my dad slammed it on his veins. I remember um, my mom crying because she had no rent money because my dad slammed it in his veins. And um, but as I started to do the work, I started to um, I started to open my eyes and you know our brain is our brain is built like a self defense. It has a self defense mechanism, right? Where it blocks out traumatic experiences that we experience as kids. And as I started to, it's kind of, it's kind of like the, the pruning process, right? As I remember this, it opens more doors, boom, I remember this. And I was able to embrace myself as a little kid and nurture myself and close those wounds. And it made perfect sense of why I became the person I became. You know what I mean? And it, and unbeknown to me, like I realized that I had resentments against my mother. And so my mother was always there for me. She was an amazing woman. But the truth is, the, the reason I treated women the way I treated them was because my mother didn't protect me as a kid, man. Like my mother kept taking this this man back, and. Not only that, when I was 14 years old, when I decided to join the gang, I was living with my mother and her new boyfriend, and my mother was allowing this man to, to, to physically um, discipline me. And that's when I ran away and decided to join the gang. My mother never protected me, and she's an amazing woman. I love my mother, rest in peace, Mom. But that was, a, that was the reason why I treated women the way I treated them. So I started to do the work, and I started to healing. And this thing I know, like, I was happy. And um, at this, meanwhile, simultaneously, I'm going to school, I'm going to college, I'm going to college. And, um, and we talk, talk about New Jim Crow, Old Jim Crow. One of the first classes I took was social and political history. And um, I, I mean, I was going to go to college, but just, you know, I wasn't really passionate about it. I was excited, like, well, I'm going to go to college again. But when I, when I learned the truth about um, our government, when I learned, the, um, learned about old Jim Crow, new Jim Crow, when I learned about um, about um, the, the the company uh, Alec, the, who who creates the laws in um in, in California, the um when I learned about mass incarceration, Thirteenth Amendment, well, I was and the truth that professor who was Native American, so that class was really good. Um, I came, I started bringing it back to my community. Like, hey, this is what's going on. Did you know this? Did you know that? And no one knew nothing. And the truth, I remember growing up, I was taught that Christopher Columbus discovered America. The school teaches us that. And I remember like, man, Christopher Columbus is cool. And I remember we had a play in first grade and I wanted so bad to play Christopher Columbus. And that's crazy how they, how the government brainwashes us, brainwashes our kids. We're taught that, um, that Washington and Jefferson were such amazing presidents. They had their face on, on, a, on a mountain, whatever. But the truth and reality, like they were slave owners and were taught to, were, were brainwashed as kids. The government brainwashes a school to prison pipeline. I go on forever about this stuff. But um, so I became, um, one day I'm washing dishes and, and they come and, um, could ask me, pull me aside. It's you know one of my childhood friends, Robert Wattis, and um and Luis Perez, and they go, you know what, look, Gabriel, like at this time, you know my my tattoos are almost off my face. So I'm like, you're doing it. You're back here every day on time, washing dishes. You're in college. Like you're doing everything you're supposed to do. Like. I feel you, you went above and beyond all, all our expectations here at Homeboy Industries. Um, would you like to be a navigator? And I was like, oh, yeah. Got that towel through that towel. I was like, oh, yeah, I'll be a navigator. So I've been a navigator for three years now. And so I'm a mentor. I work with gang members that are trying to change their lives. And, um, and I could think back to... My childhood, everything I getting B, getting B, getting seeing people overdose, being, and I could think to my child to to um 
elementary school, like hitting girls in the schoolyard, chasing them just to hit them. I remember getting all these fights, getting suspended. I remember um, I could go back to juvenile hall, still in cars, and I could think about being my being a gang member, committing horrible acts of violence, destroying families and everything. And at that moment, I understood, you know what? Like, God had me the whole time. God was holding me and carrying me through all these phases because that's the only way that I'm going to be able to stand there and tell the people that I mentor, like, hey, homie, like, I know what you're going through. And it's the only way that um, I'm going to get people to trust me, especially the youth I work with. I want to share a story about one of the kids that I work with. Um, his name is Roman. And um, so <laughs> so Roman grew up in um, Hazard Projects, very, very, very tough community. And, um, you know, he was one of the guys on my team. The thing is that I have about 50 trainees on my caseload. But outside of them, I have amazing relationships with, amazing rela relationships with so much other ones. So not every trainee that's on my caseload is going to want to want to um, open up to me. So we have four navigators. So maybe sometimes they will want to feel more comfortable opening up to another navigator, and that's fine because we're a team, right? And sometimes, the other, sometimes some trainees in other teams would feel more comfortable with me. And um, so little Roman, he... I would get phone calls from Brittany, who one of my um, co-facilitator at um, um, Homeboy Industries for Pathways to College class, and she would say, um, "Where's Roman? Like he hasn't been coming to GED." Um, but like, like, and I'll pull him aside, and I have an amazing relationship with these kids. Right? The main thing about mentoring is not to hold people accountable. Not, I mean, excuse me, we have to hold them accountable, but not not to um, give them what they've always got. Oh, you're fucking up. Oh, this and that. Oh, you can't do that. No, it's just to build a, build a relationship. And I don't, I'm not going to go talk to them about, oh, don't do drugs, don't join a gang. That's corny. That's what that's what they've heard all their lives. My main thing is just to build a relationship. And it's very crucial that I lead by example because for most of them, I'm the first positive male role model that they've ever had. And so... I would tell Roman, I pull him aside, I go, hey, have a, come here and we're going to class. He's like, ah, I don't want to go. Roman, just go to class, man. Said, All right. And it's messed up because um, on Tuesdays, um, GD is Tuesdays and Thursdays at Homeboy Industries. And I would take and, and, um, I would take my team to the museum on Tuesdays. So as we're loading up in the van, there goes Roman just looking at us load up, having to go to class. So we would tease him, by Roman. He's like, all right. So he, for, this went on for a year, but Roman started going to class every day. Every day, he said, Roman started going to class, and he started working on his GED. Um, two months ago, he, he completed his final test, and he received his GED. Um, and, um, and this semester, as I... As I end my last semester at East LA College, and I begin to work on, on my undergrad at Cal State Los Angeles, um, my last class, as I transition out of community college with my second associates, is Roman's first class transitioning into, and we share our class together. So we're side by side. We sit next to each other in class, so I could, um, you know, try to teach him. You know, teach them the roles in college, community college. So at Homeboy Industries, we have Pathways to College. So it's it's a it's a workshop. We we have it once a week. And the truth, we we come into um. We come into um, like for me, if it would have someone would have would have ever told me, like, hey, you're gonna go to college. I'm like, what the hell? No way in the world. And the truth, East LA College is right there. And mostly everyone at Homeboy Industries is from East LA, but not once do we ever step foot on a college because it's embedded in our heads since we're kids. Like, you're a fuck up, you're not gonna do shit, you're stupid. And th these are from people that are supposed to nurture us. And it's a, and we start to believe it. Like, me, you know, maybe I don't belong in college. You know, and um, 
So, and there's always, like, um, like, like Donna mentioned, when we're released, there's so much obstacles that, that are against us that the system is built to keep us down no matter what, mass incarceration. The system is built to keep us going back in no matter what. So the, the process, the, 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 FAFSA, the, FAFSA, the FAFSA applications, the, um, the um, what's it called? Um, financial aid. Um, not only that, but picking the picking the classes. So we have Brittany Morton, um, who I'm mean, seriously, she literally through my three years through through East LA College, she's helped me like academically. I mean, actually picking out my classes, my applications, and everything. Because the truth, they make these applications so hard for somebody that never had to fill out these applications that that they get they get um. They get scared. It scares, it scares them away. So at Homeboy Industries, we have we have um, fine, we have uh, academic classes. We have we have um, therapeutic classes. Um, we have four over forty We have over forty therapists. Volunteer, four volunteer therapists. Four paid therapists. Over forty volunteers. We have tattoo removal. We have tattoo removal for free. We don't charge for a tattoo removal. Um, when I first walked into the doors, my face was, I had my gang written over my face. Like literally, I had my gang written over my face. And one of the hardest steps for me was to begin, not because of the pain, that hurts like a mother, but <laughs> not because not of the pain, but my pride, you know, and, the beginning of the process of getting the tattoo removal. We have amazing legal legal services. We have um amazing senior navigator. We have we have we have case management. We have um we have everything. But most of all though, if you ever step on homeboy industries, that is the happiest place you you could ever trip on. And it's crazy because as we're flying over here, um you know the terminal. I mean the. I guess the. When before you board the plane, when you come in from that 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 long thing they have, like an ET, remember ET, that long thing. So we're walking right, and all the lights are off. So it's first of all, I'm scared as hell because it's raining, and I've never flown on the. I never flown on the rain, but second of all, it's all dark. So it's like man, this is crazy. It's like we're walking to our doom. You know what I mean? So we're walking, and the lights go on, and the lady behind me. She says, oh, I don't know if I'm, I was more scared of the dark or because of you, because your tattoos. And it's like, wow. And I laughed about it, right? But it's like, man, if you only knew, like, I'm the nicest guy on earth, man. And everything that I've talked about, the person that I was, like, it's, it's I would tell people, I tell, when I tell people my story at Homeboy Industries, they're like, no way. I'm like, yes way. That's who I was. And I have a lot of homeboys that from my neighborhood that I grew up with, homegirls that I grew up with at Homeboy Industries that, that I brought aboard. And, um, you know, and I still talk to my homeboys. I talk to my homeboys from my neighborhood that I grew up with, whoever's left. But my homeboys, everyone always reaches out to me now. And they used to ask, call me for, text me for um, drugs and for guns and stuff like that. But now it's like they call me to try to get into a drug program or to try to get a job, or try, or try to, um, you know, try to change their life, trying to, trying to get into our program. So, I think I'm out of time. But um, thank you, everybody, and go Sunday. Wilson.